nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. These people aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. When he said, such were some of you. Amen. Notice that's in the past tense. Amen. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The problem with modern religion is they want to take that out of the past tense and put it in the present tense and say, such are some of you, but you can't help it. It's not your fault. It's the way you were born. It's the circumstances that you faced in life. It's just the, the, the uh, poverty of your circumstances and your situation. Sorry, there's nothing you can do but struggle with it the rest of your life. But that's not the message of the Bible. The gospel tells us that there's power to be transformed. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Whereas in times past ye walked according to the course of this world. But God who is rich in mercy hath raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places. The prophet Isaiah said, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. I don't know where anybody finds a sinning religion in that verse. Right. God said cease to do evil and that was clear back in the Old Testament. Right. Yes. Right. That was back under the Old Testament law when they didn't have the privileges that you and I have. God said cease to do evil. On at least two occasions Jesus said go and sin no more. Right. And he declares boldly in 1 John 3, 9 that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Right. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. It's not saying there's not the possibility of sin. There is the possibility of committing sin and backsliding. But what the scripture is telling us is that a person who is born of God has a new life within him. And that new life prevents him from sinning. As long as he's holding the hand of God. As long as he's walking in the light of truth. He cannot be sinning at the same time. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the solid rock found upon which the true church is built. It's a message of transformation. And I want to tell you, it still avails today. I know it seems like there's a lot in society that it just is wrong. Just a lot of bad things out there. Just a lot of evil. And we long for the reality of seeing lives transformed. I'm glad to tell you, Jesus is still in the business of transforming lives. Sin's chains are broken. There was the wild man of Gadara. He couldn't be tamed. They bound him with chains and he broke the chains. He lived as a madman among the tombs. He was possessed by a legion of devils. He was in a hopeless condition. He had been given up as a hopeless case. But Jesus came on the scene. And when Jesus comes on the scene, there is always hope. He didn't come with new chains to bind the man again. He didn't come with a club to beat him into submission. He didn't come with a bottle of pills to calm him down and subdue him. But he came to transform him. He came to chase the demons out and deliver him from their torturous power. They cried out against him. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. But at his command, they had to go. And when the people showed up to see what had happened, they saw a man sitting calmly, clothed, and in his right mind. Praise the Lord. I'm glad Jesus puts people in their right mind. He'd been delivered. They saw a man transformed. He'd been told, or he hadn't been told to tap into his inner self and find the good that was there and just try to bring it out. He hadn't been given a handbook on how to control his behavior, yes, sir. but he'd been delivered. He'd been transformed. He was born again. Amen. Henry Milan was a young man with a bright future. A job in a print shop had given him a good start in life and he loved it. But one day the men he worked with invited him to go with them to the saloon for lunch. He went along and he watched them drink and noted their manner at the bar. To their credit, they did not offer young Henry a drink that afternoon. But later on in the day when the work was slack in the print shop, Henry slipped out and ran back to the saloon. With a nonchalant air, he tossed a coin on the counter and called for a glass of whiskey. In imitation of the men, he brought it to his lips with a sweeping gesture. He hesitated a moment, wondering what would be the effect. But then impulsively, he tilted the glass. And he said that first swallow burned a path of liquid fire to his stomach. But with it came a feeling of experience and sophistication. 
He was now one of the fellows. And as he walked away from the saloon, he straightened himself in his new sense of manhood. And with the lever of curiosity, he had pried open the floodgates, which were to admit years of liquid sorrow, more liquid remorse, more liquid hell than he knew the world possessed. Henry Milan became a drunkard. Fast forward 35 years. Henry's life is literally controlled by his thirst for alcohol. Time and again, he's tried to make a new start in life. Time and time again, he's tried to shake the habit. But time and again, he has fallen back into its ugly grasp. He's a prisoner, a slave to the liquor that he thought would set him free. During those many years, he made many sojourns to the alcoholic ward in Bellevue Hospital in New York City. It was described as a charnel house of living death. It was there in that alcoholic ward on one occasion that the head of the psychiatric ward came to see Henry. Henry began to tell him the whole story of his bitter struggle with his habit, hoping, hoping wistfully that this, this man skilled in medicine might have some message of hope for him. And after the conclusion of Henry's words, the kind doctor sat silent for a few moments, then reached out his hand and patted that of his patient and simply said, I'm sorry, Henry. But there's nothing we can do for you. You've gone too far. A few days later, Henry was visited by another doctor. and He said as he looked at that doctor, he thought his face bore the resemblance of sainthood. And he thought, well, maybe here's a man who can give me hope. But that hope quickly faded when the doctor shook his head and he too said, Henry, it's too bad, but there's nothing that can be done for you. Henry made no attempt to speak, but simply shut his eyes and turned wearily on his pillow. Medical science had declared him to be incurable. He contemplated on the things his mother had taught him as a boy, and questions began to come to his mind. What about the one of whom she spoke that could help? Was there such a one, or perhaps maybe were her words just the poetic fancies that mothers use to amuse their children? Henry didn't know, but what he did know that was that whatever spark of faith there had been within him was now flickering out. A few days later, a third doctor came into Henry's room, and this doctor had with him a group of students. He proceeded to lecture those young aspiring doctors concerning the extent of Henry's condition, the extreme effect that alcohol had taken on his body, and finally the professor said slowly, this man can never be cured. Nothing can save him. You are looking at a hopeless incurable. A few days later, Henry was released from the hospital, but those words hung over him like a death sentence. It was right about that time that the Salvation Army engaged in what they called the Boozers Convention. And it was a concerted effort to go out and, and find the drunkards on the streets of New York City and bring them in, feed them a meal, and preach them the gospel. And so it was that on Thanksgiving Day of 1910, Henry Milans crawled out from under a warehouse loading platform where he had spent the night. Nearly frozen, he sat down, miserable, on an empty box, contemplating his hopeless condition. They had said he's incurable. Momentarily, Henry heard footsteps and looked up, expecting to see a guard coming to run him off. But instead, he looked into the eyes of a girl dressed in the uniform of the Salvation Army. And she said to Henry, aren't you tired of the life of degradation and sin? To which he replied in a hollow tone, he said, the doctors and the specialists have declared that I am incurable. That young Salvation Army girl thought for a moment on what he had said, and, and then she, she, she gathered some boldness about herself, and she declared, of course, they can't cure you. But listen, Jesus can cure you and make you a good man if you'll let him. Yeah. And then she told him of the meeting that was planned for that day. Would he come? Henry said, I'll be there. That afternoon, Henry crowded into a seat at the back of the Salvation Army Hall. And after a song, a man arose and began to speak, insisting that not only did God have the power to forgive sin, but that he also had the power to take away the very appetite for liquor. Yeah. The craving within Henry told him that it could not be so. But something deep in his heart whispered to his unyielding mind that perhaps, just maybe, there was something to Mother's religion. Right. Yeah. Maybe there still is a glimmer of hope. Right. 
the close of the meeting, an invitation was given. About 300 men went forward to the altar to pray. Henry was not among them. He held back and looked upon those that were seeking God. And in his mind, he wondered, will they find anything there? But he convinced himself that afternoon that his case was hopeless. They might find some help down there at that altar, but there was no hope for Henry. But somehow something brought him back again the next night. You see, God doesn't give up. I wonder sometimes if we give up long before God does. God didn't give up. Henry was back the next night. This time he heard a message preached on hope. For a week he continued to attend the meetings at the Salvation Army Hall. Army Hall. He longed to be delivered from the habit that bound him. But the power of unbelief was so strong. For 35 years he'd been bound by the habit. And now on top of all his own failure and hopelessness, the best brains of medical science had declared him incurable. Hell had done its worst to leave Henry in the depths of despair. But heaven had come to challenge hell. And there was a little group of Salvation Army people that had begun to pray for Henry. They declared that God could make him a new man. And finally, after a week of nights, Henry stumbled forward to the penitent form. And there he began to pour out his soul to God in an agony of desire. This time not a desire for whiskey, but a desire to be delivered. Henry continued to pray, determined he was going to get what he had come for. He prayed on and the victory didn't come easy, but Henry was determined. He prayed on. And when it seemed like he, he had uh, in, uh, sapped his entire strength through supplication, Henry said, finally there stole gently across his troubled spirit, quietly and softly like the feet of the dawning day, the consciousness of a great peace. He said he seemed to feel close beside him, a comforting presence. And though he heard, thought he heard within uh, an inner voice which said, come, we will start life all over again without the habits that have spoiled it. Trust me, I will keep you. And the words of Jesus penetrated deep into the heart of Henry Milans, and he rose from that altar a new man, delivered from the habit that had bound him for 35 years, and he went on to live a life for God. The master, the hand of the master, had reached down into the depths of depravity, found the man that it sought, and lifted him out, and from that moment on, he was a transformed individual. Yeah. And I want to tell you tonight, it may be discouraging as we pray for individuals and seek to win the lost, but I want to tell you, Jesus is still the same yesterday and today and forever. And if He can find a group of people like that group of Salvation Army people that just got a hold of God for Henry and said, we won't take no for an answer. We're going to pray and seek God because we know God can deliver him. Whatever the experts and the medical professionals say, doesn't matter. God can deliver him. And whoever you're praying about tonight and whoever your church is working with, I want to tell you there's good news. The Holy Spirit is just as faithful tonight as he was for Henry Milans. And if we'll pray and believe God and get a hold of God and refuse to take no for an answer, I believe we can see some people transformed in our day and age. This evening you may not be bound by the same chains that shackled Henry Milan, but I want to ask you, is there something in your life that has robbed you of hope? Some hidden sins perhaps that no one knows about? Something the devil has convinced you will never change? I want to tell you the same God who changed Henry Milan can still transform you, whatever your need might be. The true church is comprised of those who have been transformed. God's purpose, as we read there in Ephesians, is to present the church without spot or blemish. But quickly, number two, the church, the true church tonight is the church tested and tried. First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. If you're going through a trial, don't think it's something strange. It's to be expected. And the scripture goes on there and it says, but rejoice. Rejoice. Now that just goes totally contrary to normal human thinking, doesn't it? Rejoice when you're facing trouble. Rejoice when things are going wrong. I thank God for my father. I have a godly father who's been a tremendous influence on my life. I thank God for it. But you know, I remember growing up, my dad wasn't much of a mechanic. But he didn't like to pay other people to do his mechanic work either, so he would try. 
And I remember dad out working on the car and I could always tell when something went wrong. <laughs> Not because he threw the wrench or screamed and hollered, but my dad, when something would really go wrong and wasn't working out right and he didn't know what to do, he would simply say, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> so rejoice. <laughs> Rejoice when some strange thing, something happens. Don't count it a strange thing. But he says rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So the trials here seems to, to indicate to me here in this scripture that it's saying the trials here create the possibility for even greater joy in the future and in heaven. He says, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And not only so, Romans 5, 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Do you glory in your tribulations? When somebody gives you trouble? When somebody makes it hard for you because you're serving Jesus, the Bible says you should rejoice in that. It said it works patience. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Have you ever prayed for patience? Like one guy said, Lord, give me patience, but hurry up. <laughs> well, so maybe when you have a trial, say, thank you, Lord, I, I must have needed some patience. Because the Bible says the trials work out patience. Yes. So when you're having a bad day, did you ever have a bad day when everything just went wrong? I read a little story about Chippy the parakeet. The problems for Chippy started one day when his owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> she removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck the hose in the cage. Just then the phone rang, she turned to pick it up, and just about the time she said hello, shoop, Chippy got sucked into the vacuum. She realized what had happened, she gasped and put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, opened the bag, and there was Chippy inside that bag, still alive but stunned. He was covered with dust and soot, so she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water to wash him off. And then she realized poor Chippy's soaking wet and shivering, and she did what any compassionate burn owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the pet <laughs> with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. Well, a few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event called Chippy's owner to find out how the bird was doing. How's he recovering? And she said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> but did you know the devil sometimes would like to give you a bad day so that you'd lose your song? So you just sit and stare? Right. Do you know we have to fight against that? Yes, sir. Yes. We have to rise up and plead the blood sometimes against the devil. He just likes to give you a bad day. But you know you can have a bad day and come to the end of that day and still sing? Still have a song. In fact, the songwriter said you can have a song in your heart in the night. Amen. Because the church, the true church, is a church that's tried and tested. Yes. It's not something strange. The devil hates it that you're serving God. He's going to be tr bring trials and tribulations in into your life. And you see, there are those who just do not like what you stand for. There are those who just hate the fact that you're serving God. And you know why they hate it? One reason is it puts them under conviction. And Jesus said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now that sort of puzzles our minds. Didn't the angels say when they announced the birth of Christ? Didn't they say peace on earth? Did not Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers? Yes, he did. But Jesus is telling us something here with that, that is a part of the truth of the gospel as well. And that is, I didn't come just to make peace with those who hate religion. I didn't come to compromise with the devil just to make peace. He said, I am, I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
Jesus was saying there's going to be opposition to his message. There would be those who would rise up in opposition even to their own family members. But Jesus went on to say we must have it settled to follow him and put him first. It wasn't long after the day of Pentecost until the early church began to face persecution. The devil hates the true church. He hates the message of the church. He hates the fact that there are those who are triumphant over sin. And when the church began to expand following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the devil wasn't one bit happy. And he began to seek to destroy the church. He proved himself to be that roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. And he brought opposition, he brought persecution to those who dared to proclaim the gospel. And Jesus had said it would happen. He said, beware of men, they'll deliver you up to the councils. They'll scourge you in their synagogues. He said, they'll, be, they'll deliver you to be afflicted. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And they found that to be a reality pretty quick after Jesus went back to heaven. And they began to preach the gospel. Peter and John have been used there in Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 3 there, the healing of the lame man. And, and they were be, be preaching to the people. And it says, as they spake to the people in chapter 4, that the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came, and, and they were grieved that they taught the people and that they preached Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And so they laid hands on them and they put them in the hold until the next day. On and on we could go, reading the persecution there in the early church. But did the church die because of it? Oh no, look at what happened. In verse 4 it says, How be it many of them which heard the word believed? And the number of the men was about 5,000. And so here's the pious religious leaders. Oh, here these men are preaching Jesus. We've got to do something to stop it. We've got to do something to squelch this message. They're undermining our power. They're undermining our control of the people. Let's stamp it out. Let's grab Peter and John and put them in prison and we'll figure out what to do. We've got to put a stop to this, but it backfired on them because now they've got 5,000 more. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God, Jesus said, I will build my church. And he does a good job at building his church. Later on, Stephen became the first Christian martyr and as they stoned him to death, because of his faith, but Stephen had something that couldn't be destroyed with stones. He had an experience in his heart that was real. He knew what it was to be delivered from sin and have a relationship with Jesus. And as they were torturing him, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Praise the Lord. The church tonight is the church tried and tested. Rest assured the devil is going to do something to test you and bring trials into your life. But hold on to the hand of God. He'll carry you through. He's promised to be with us and never forsake us. But finally and quickly tonight, I want to consider the thought of the church triumphant. Triumphant over sin. We've already talked about that. The, the transformation, the deliverance from sin. Triumphant in soul winning. We've touched on that. God has a purpose for us to be reaching the lost. And he wants us to be triumphant. Soul winning is not easy. It's discouraging at times. But I thought of Caleb. You remember Caleb, he was 85 years old and it was time to go in and possess the land of Canaan. And he said to Joshua way back there when we first tried to go into Canaan and, and the people, the, the spies, the ten spies didn't want to go in. And way back then he said, Moses promised me a certain piece of land. And he looked at Joshua and he said, now therefore give me this mountain. He said, I'm just as strong now as I was when I was 40 years old. I'm going to go and take it because my strength is coming from God. And I thought as we look at situations and souls and individuals that we're praying for and, and, and needs that abound in our churches, it's easy to get discouraged. But I think maybe we can learn from Caleb as he said, give me this mountain. Lord, just give me this mountain. You know, the Bible says that at the presence of the Lord, the mountains will flow down. And I believe we ought to pray that prayer of Caleb. Lord, give me this mountain. We can be a triumphant church even in difficult times. But I want to think about the thought that we're triumphant for eternity. In the letter to the church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, the Lord said, I know your works and tribulations. He said, the, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. You'll have tribulations ten days. But he said, be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee the crown of life. That's the picture of the final triumph of the, of the church of Christ. And John saw it in Revelation. 
He said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Oh, thank the Lord. He's going to be cast down one of these days. He's accused you. He's tried to defeat you. He's tried to trip you up. He's laid stumbling blocks in your pathway. But there's coming a day when the accuser of the brethren is going to be cast down. And it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto the death. In chapter 21 and verse 7, he said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. God is not through with his church. He wants you to be an overcomer, to be triumphant in this world and triumphant for all eternity. We have a picture of that triumphant church in Revelation 7. For as John is beholding the scene before him and writing down what he sees, he said, I beheld, and lo, there was a great multitude, a multitude that could not be numbered of all nations and kindreds and people. He said they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were clothed in white robes, and they had palms in their hands. And as he looked upon that enchanting scene, John said there was one of the elders that stood by him, and he asked him a question. John what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? John was a smart man. He knew better than to give an answer that he didn't really know for sure about. And so he said to that elder, he said, Sir, thou knowest. <laughs> and he said, that elder said to him, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He said, They're before the throne of God. They, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And he said, God's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. That is the church triumphant. Who are they, John? Are they members of a certain church in a certain denomination? Are they individuals who had a deep understanding of doctrine and philosophy? No, oh, no. Who are they, John? Are they people of wealth and prominence in society? Are they men and women whom the world lauded with honor and prestige? Oh, no, but John, these are they that came out of great tribulation. These are they that the world scorned and mocked and ridiculed. They've been strangers and pilgrims in a world of sinful pleasure. But tonight, John, they're no longer strangers. Here they are, the child of God, the children of God. They were mocked and scorned by the masses. They were brushed off as insignificant and unworthy of honor. But here they are, John. They're marching on through all eternity, the church of Jesus Christ, triumphant. Praise the Lord tonight. I'm glad... Jesus is still building the church. Let's hold on. Let's not be discouraged. Many around us are giving in to the spirit of the day, giving in to the, to the modern, modern religion that says you can just keep on going in your sin and enjoy the pleasures of sinful living and still make it to heaven. But let's not compromise the message of the gospel. Let's lift up our heads. We have nothing to be ashamed of tonight. If we're a part of the church, we are a church triumphant for time and for eternity. And Jesus said, I'll build it. I'll build it on the rock. The rock that the devil cannot destroy. The foundation that the devil cannot overthrow. Jesus Christ. The rock of our salvation. The foundation of the church. Let's determine tonight we're going to be a part of that true church. The church that is transformed. And the church that, yes, goes through trials and testings. But the church that is going to be triumphant and see Jesus face to face one of these days. Thank the Lord. Let's stand together. Praise God. Praise the Lord. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, oh, sorrow will erase. So the Lord. You're dismissed.